for our annual meeting. Today is part two, our special meeting, where we will be presenting to you our overall evaluation. The reason why this sector of our work or body of work is so important, especially to me, is because I came into Cincinnati Preschool Promise as a program and evaluation manager. That means I have the wonderful opportunity to work in all of, with all of our programs, tuition assistance, quality improvement, and then our public quality community where we support all of our ways initiatives. Today I have the honor of presenting our team from innovation. It's for Dr. Monica Mitchell, Dr. Aubrey Polk, and Peter Petronio, where they'll be talking about our comprehensive evaluation that focuses on our quantitative data. Um, they'll take a dive into our KRA information, also our preschool of progress, region access, but most importantly, the overall impact that we have through Cincinnati Preschool Promise. We ask that you guys all um, provide feedback on what you've heard today, but most importantly, sit back and listen to the impact, the collective impact that we had together today. We see many of our partners in the room, or seats, peanut butter and jam, and everyone else out here today. So we thank you for the impact, collective impact that you guys empowered us to have because you support us each and every day. So at this time, we'll turn it over to our evaluators and Dr. Mike Mitchell. Thank you so much. So Innovations is uh, equally proud to work with uh, your team, Tanitra, and uh, all of the CPP staff on this evaluation. Uh, the first rule of evaluation is let the data speak for itself. So I think what you'll see today is um, data that uh, reflects the mission and vision of Cincinnati Preschool Promise and the uh, great work that has happened uh, since the um, initiative's inception. Um, so really my work right now is to introduce uh, the team that will be presenting the evaluation. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Aubrey Culp, who leads the evaluation on behalf of Innovations, and Peter Petronio, who serves as a uh, lead analyst. And, um, I think you'll see here, I think Audrey will talk a little bit more about the rest of the team. And uh, we do have a fabulous team at Innovations. I do want to mention that we've been doing evaluation work since 2000. Uh, one of our first contracts actually was with uh, Success by Six. And um, it was actually our second contract. Uh, our first contract was with Family Sport, which was a United Way funded agency. And our third contract was with Cincinnati Public Schools and uh, we still have all of these contracts today. So we're really proud to do work in the evaluation space. Um, <clears throat> our mission and vision is to um, not only uh, work with, with organizations who share our mission of improving uh, physical, mental health, social development outcomes, um, but more importantly, we understand that you know, our work is actually easy, which is to help measure the progress, and it's really uh, the work of other teams who are making the progress, who are really on the front lines of this work. So again, we're really proud to have been doing this work for so many years um, with CPP, but, but in the early childhood space, uh, which um, is um, the majority of, of our portfolio, to be honest with you. But again, without further ado, I want to bring Aubrey Culp up, so thank you. tonight to share the year seven evaluation results which covers the 2023-24 uh, school year. So we collected um, quantitative and qualitative data from multiple sources including student performance metrics, program reach and access, and teacher provider and parent feedback to understand the impact of CPP. So for the next hour, I'll be sharing those results with you. Um, as Monica said, this is our team and just wanted to give a big thanks to them and also our consultants, Crystal Kendrick with Voice of Your Customer and Dr. Jennifer Williams, as well as our partners. 
with Cincinnati Public Schools, Four Seeds, our other early education agencies in the community that work with us, and also the preschool parents, teachers, and providers that we engage. We all work together to make this evaluation possible. Um, and also a special thanks to the um, CPT Community Evaluation Advisory Panel. So that's a diverse group of preschool parents, teachers, and providers who are directly involved with Cincinnati Preschool Promise. And we meet with them throughout the year to hear their experiences, get their expertise, and their feedback on our evaluation plan, which then we include in the work that we're doing. This is a look at our evaluation report and a table of contents. So what I plan to cover today is children's progress in preschool through third grade, the reach and accessibility of the CPP community provider network, insights from providers and preschoolers, and our recommendations. But this just gives you a glimpse of all of the elements that are included in our evaluation. So I hope that you will take a look at the full report. There's a QR code on the executive summary that you might have in front of you that um, tomorrow I think you'll be able to go to the Cincinnati Preschool Promise website and see the full report there. All right, so without further ado, we want to give you a high level look at the year seven evaluation results before we take the deep dive into the data. So what the evaluation showed is that Cincinnati Preschool Promise tuition assistance or you might hear me say TA, it is promoting positive trends in enrollment and attendance in community preschools. We saw enrollment increase by 17.3% since last year, and attendance reached 88.4%. CPP is also improving preschool quality and increasing equitable access to high quality preschool. We saw more providers achieving that high quality, step up to quality rating, which resulted in an increased number of high quality seats available to students in the network. And CPP exceeded its goal to serve 35% of the eligible population. They actually served 40% of the eligible three to four year old population here in Cincinnati. And just wanna take a moment to pause and really celebrate that because when you put this achievement into context, just in the state of Ohio, um, Ohio is ranked 36th in enrollment for four-year-olds, and that's only 11% of the population. And for three-year-olds, it's only 2% in their ranks 26. So what we've done here in Cincinnati with getting 40% of children enrolled in high-quality preschool through CPP is, is really incredible and something that is worth celebrating. Um, the evaluation also showed that CPP provides essential supports that benefit preschool teachers, providers, children, and families. We continue to see the benefits of the staff grants this year through increased teacher retention and quality improvement, as well as um, <coughs> developmental progress of preschoolers that receive special in-school programming through the peanut butter and GM program. The evaluation continued to show that kindergarten readiness is higher for Cincinnati Preschool Promise tuition assistance participants when compared to their similar peers who did not get tuition assistance. And that CPP was also a statistically significant predictor of performance on kindergarten readiness. We found that the um, current CPP preschoolers, as well as former tuition assistance recipients that are now in grades one through three, they are showing growth from fall to spring on assessments. So we're now just getting to see the, the long-term impacts of CPP and what it means for a child to have a high quality preschool experience. So we'll spend the rest of our time diving deeper into these um, findings, starting with the preschooler progress. All right, so Assessments are just one way to evaluate preschooler progress. So we looked at the Teaching Strategies Gold, or the TS Gold, which is a formative evidence-based preschooler progress assessment that's administered multiple times throughout the year, where teachers document observations of a child's developmental level and growth along multiple domains of learning. And then the preschooler's abilities are scored as either below, meeting, or exceeding expectations for their age. 
So you can see in the graph um, on this slide, the percentage of preschoolers who met or exceeded expectations for their age. So in the yellow, um, those are the fall scores, and in the green, those are their spring scores. So we saw universal improvement across all domains of the TS goal with the tested preschoolers showing the greatest improvements in math, literacy, and social emotional domains. And that was a more than 30 percentage point increase from fall to spring for those um, three domains. Um, another part of evaluation that examines preschooler progress is the peanut butter and jam or the PB and J pilot program. So this is an interactive music program that is created for preschoolers to learn through singing and dancing and using musical instruments. And this year the program was expanded to 13 sites and there were 144 preschoolers that participated. Uh, we also surveyed the teachers and providers from those participating programs about the impact of peanut butter and jam on their students. And those survey items aligned with um, the domains of the TS goal. And so what those teachers and providers said, 90.5% of them said that they, um, the preschoolers who attended the program showed improvement in observable behavior from fall to spring in that assessment. And then over the years, we've also gotten TS goal results from some preschoolers in the peanut butter and jam program. And we've seen consistent trends in those preschoolers demonstrating progress from fall to spring. And this year was no different. The preschoolers who attended the peanut butter and jam program improved from fall to spring on all domains of the TS goal. And almost 100% of them are meeting or exceeding expectations by spring. Yes. <laughs> Um, we also heard from the teachers and providers in the program that it is um, beneficial with one of the providers saying that the weekly sessions help children develop trust with adults and caregivers, cooperate with peers, and communicate effectively. Children learn to listen and work together to promote healthy relationship skills. They learn the importance of respecting one another's space. Peanut butter and jam sessions also help with mood regulation by being an emotional stimulus. And another provider said that the PB and GM sessions give them the opportunity to observe the children's growth and it also gives them ideas to educate children in a different approach. So from the data that we've gathered, it really seems that PB and GM is a positive program for teachers, providers, and it's benefiting preschool progress. So now I will turn it over to Peter to walk us through our kindergarten readiness results. Okay, um, so the kindergarten readiness assessment revised, or KRAR, um, is one of the ways we understand readiness for recipients of the uh, tuition assistance. We know from extensive research that children entering kindergarten with the readiness gap are likely to experience ongoing development challenges. Uh, we also know that children who, intent, uh, who attend high quality uh, preschools show greater readiness for formal education. So in this section of the presentation we'll look at uh, KRA bar scores of preschool programs tuition assistance recipients and uh, some follow-up data as well into uh, grades one to three. Um, so for this evaluation, we will just focus on two measures for K, um, from the KRAR. Uh, the first is the overall KRAR um, performance levels, which are from lowest to highest, emerging, approaching, and demonstrating. Uh, the second is the cutoff score for language and literacy subtest, which in indicates uh, if the student is on track for literacy. So here's a summary of the uh, latest kindergarten cohort and comparison group. Each year we track CBP participants at CPS kindergartens and evaluate their test scores in comparison to, <clears throat> in comparison to peers that did not receive CPP tuition assistance. During the 23-24 academic year, 
760 participants with parental consent or matched to carry our scores. And these participants attended the CPP pro provider between the 21-22 and the 22-23 uh, program years. So these are demographics for uh, the participants and um, them compared to the 1,651 non-CPP uh, who also completed the KRAR at CPS kindergartens. The CPP cohort uh, has a large, uh, larger percentage of black and African American students compared to the non-CPP comparison group, and they also, um, also more often reside in uh, lower socioeconomic status areas, and those are represented by the uh, SES 1 and 2 quartiles shown in the table. So as in previous evaluations, social and economic context is measured in SES quartiles, and those are SES 1 and 4. Um, the map here shows uh, the geocoded ARAR cohort with the box uh, color-coded by quartile. And SES quartiles allow us to estimate social and economic conditions that may affect uh, academics, behavior, and development. Uh, lower quartiles like SES 1 and 2 represent the more at-risk areas uh, whereas higher quartiles like SES 3 and 4 represent areas with fewer risks. So the quartiles use five indicators um, for socioeconomic status, and they're listed here on the slide, um, and those include the factors for income, education, occupation, family structure, and neutrality. Uh, and when we look at SES quartiles, it's important to understand they do not represent the SES of an individual, but rather the average characteristics of the families that live within the geographic area. So here's our first look at the KRAR results between groups. Uh, so this slide is an overview of the predictive qualities of CPP. Preschool Promise participation was a statistically significant predictor of KRAR performance in year seven when controlling for gender, race, and SES increased the odds of demonstrating readiness by 30.5% and the odds of being on track for literacy by 53.8%. So we are continuing to see the benefits of CPP tuition assistance as we have in previous cohorts, and that's especially after we account for the other related variables. Uh, this shows the overall carrier performance for the entire CPP kindergarten cohort. And this is regardless of other factors such as race or SES. Um, this shows that participants had a combined approaching or demonstrating percentage of 62.6% compared to 60.9% of non-CPP. And these are um, approaching and demonstrating are the uh, um, regions on the left chart showed in the two shades of green. When we look at the language of literacy uh, self-test results, in the chart on the right, you see the similar pattern. Uh, this shows 40.7% of participants were on track for literacy compared to 30.9% of non-CPP. At this point, we move to viewing KRAR performance in the context of socioeconomic status. And this is where we begin to see the differences uh, between participants and non-participants in this year's We've seen uh, in prior years, CPP had the largest impact among uh, children living in SES 1 and 2 neighborhoods. Uh, the figure shows the, particip uh, the participants in SES 1 and 2 were approaching or demonstrating readiness at greater frequencies than non-participants within the same quartile. And that is to say among students who live in areas uh, with a higher number of associated risk factors, CPP had a significant effect on their readiness for kindergarten and for somatic context, uh, more than two-thirds of all CPP participants in this year's cohort fell within these two quartiles. These findings are also true for uh, language and literacy results. The CPP and SES 1 and 2 were on track for literacy more often than their peers in the same cohort or the same quartile, uh, as was the case in prior years for evaluation. CPP showed less of an impact higher SES quartiles, and the reason 
this relationship does not extend to SES treatment or its pollution due to differences in access and resource. So um, remember that uh, I said SES core tiles uh, are based on wear and initial lifts, but does not tell us individual economic circumstances. So we know that SES three and four families, for example, have higher income levels um, or tend to in rank, but we also know that preschool promise tuition assisted families are under 300% federal poverty level, with the majority of which being under 100% FPL. So with that in mind, preschool promise kids in SES 3 and 4 are likely to differ from the non-CDP pairs within the same cohorts. Uh, here's a look at here they are uh, by, by race. Uh, we see how performance varied by preschool promise participation, primarily within black or African American and Hispanic in both cases, participants within these populations were more frequently approaching or demonstrating readiness compared to non-CDP of uh, the same race. And the results for language and literacy were similar. Participants were more often on track compared to non-CDP among black or African American and Hispanic students. So in this case, uh, the relationship also extended to multiracial or other. Uh, as seen in previous evaluation years, White kindergartners continue to score higher overall, but the relationship between CDP and non-CDP remains reversed. And this is also believed to be due to differences in income levels. So families uh, living below poverty are likely overrepresented among CDP participants compared to the non-participating peers. So now we broaden our view uh, and look at uh, the results in context that extends out side of Cincinnati. Um, the box highlighted yellow uh, shows all CPS related results, including CPP participants, non-CPP, and the rates for the entire district, which includes both of those groups. And, and when we compare participants uh, against the entire CPS district um, and other similar districts throughout the state, we still see that participants are approaching and demonstrating readiness at higher levels. Um, so, for example, the CPP participants are approaching or demonstrating at 62.6% uh, compared to 51.5% of Dayton, which would be a difference of 11.1% of the points. And that relationship is also present when we look at language and literacy results. Specifically, the CPP participants are more frequently on track compared to all the other districts here. And going back to our example, um, CPP we are on track 40.7% compared to 28.4% of Dayton, and that's a difference of 12.3 percentage points. So some initial analysis were conducted to look at other factors related to kindergarten uh, readiness. And these analysis are limited uh, only to CPP participants. Did not, they did not include non-CPP. That we found some differences based on residential mobility, uh, more than 26% of CPP participants in this kindergarten cohort changed their residential address more and more times over the course of preschool and up to kindergarten enrollment. And those who indicated no mobility tended to have stronger KRAR scores than those who experienced mobility by a difference of 3.2 percentage points for approaching and demonstrating rates and a difference of 7.4 points for on-track on rates. Uh, preschool attendance was another factor they explored participants had better um, performance on the KRAR and the, uh, their preschool attendance rates for 90% or higher. And this effect was more pronounced for four-year-old preschoolers. Four-year-olds with 90% preschool attendance or higher were approaching or demonstrating at a rate of 60.6% compared to 46.1% of those with attendance below that threshold. For on-track rates, these differences were 40.4% also in favor of those who have higher attendance rates. And uh, this just highlights the trends in um, kindergarten readiness over the lifespan of preschool promise. CPP tuition assistance recipients have consistently scored higher uh, in kindergarten readiness than non-recipients since 2018. Uh, we also consistently see that uh, participants in high-risk neighborhoods have shown better KRA performance compared to non-CPP years living in similar areas. And lastly, participations continue to have the greatest impact among black and Hispanic preschoolers. So 
So now we move uh, a, bit, uh, we, a bit beyond kindergarten. Um, we're now to the point where we can track uh, CPP participants to third grade. And these are English language arts test results for former participants. And when we compare them uh, with similar peers, which in this case are students uh, meeting the state's definition of economic disadvantage, the participants appear to be doing a little better. And we see a small difference in terms of the percentage proficient or higher, but even more in terms of their reduced percentage in the limited category. And we don't see the same relationships when we compare them to, this, to the district as a whole, which has uh, a much more soci socioeconomically diverse population. And this slide uh, shows uh, third grade math scores that we matched the preschool promise of their work. And again, we found that preschool promise kids were more often proficient or higher compared to CPS economic disadvantage, but uh, by a slightly larger difference in this case. And we are also seeing fewer participants in the limited, limited category. And again, we see that that relationship differs when compared to the entire district. The additional follow-up follow analysis we conducted um, uh, was on the uh, grades one and three. One to three that were administered at the end of the EA math growth reading assessment. And here we are comparing the fall to spring scores to assess growth. And we are also comparing uh, to national norms via percentile scores. And you'll see that results are shown in terms of uh, five percentile groupings. They're labeled from low to high known as quintiles. And in all uh, cohorts seen here, uh, we saw growth in terms of participants in the top three quintiles, which are the, the shade of blue. Uh, or in the case of the first grader, they maintained a uh, higher percentiles at um, both fall and spring. And we also found that median scores for CPP participants tended to be closer to the national norm at the end of the and that suggests that they're keeping pace with peers regardless of their socioeconomic factors. Another opportunity here is that we can continue all of these first and second graders in this group here to uh, see into uh, next year's uh, evaluation, which can reevaluate their math growth results. And our hope is to continue to explore these cohorts uh, and hopefully identify patterns. And at this point, I thought I can pause for questions as well. Okay. One of the uh, characteristics I was interested in is looking at the comparison between ELL communities versus non-ELL communities. I'm not sure if you've ever looked at that link for families in that community who don't have English as a primary language. No, we haven't looked at all reason why I ask is, uh, is, is it could be an opportunity for us to tap into for growth in our program. I know that's something we're seeing huge representation in our schools. So as we start talking about getting started in kindergarten, a, a large number of families are coming in. And I do wonder if, uh, if our traditional sources for touching parents at two, three, four are able to penetrate that community. Um, well, and, and I'm jumping to the end, but I asked my big picture question. One of the things I did see in the recommendations was a lot of what we should continue to do. Um, I wasn't sure if you guys saw the things that we should consider to stop doing or something that we probably should place a greater emphasis on as we move forward to continue to make impact. last one at this time, Marcia, at this time. <laughs> one of the things I would be interested in is so I saw the comparison CPS versus Dayton, Cleveland, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it was brought to my attention, I think, at our first meeting that Dayton was one of the first cities to make a commitment to early childhood education. I would be curious, as we think about our CPP students, how do our CPP students compare to their students who have engaged or participated in any type of early childhood to see, okay, Apples to true apples is our is our is our recipe for success just as good or better. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a question.
question on the comparison, the demographic characteristics between the CPP and then the non-CPP participants. So are you, when you're doing the control, is that where you're saying, like, if, what I'm wondering, is there differences in there that seem like they could be meaningful in terms of the racial dynamic and the socioeconomic? So is the control, when you're controlling for that, is that where you're saying, hey, we're trying to kind of sort through some of that, and if they were more similar, this is what you would expect? I'm trying to understand what the control is versus when you see just the chart by itself, I guess. Yeah, well, a good way of thinking about that is from OSD. First, the chart is just a slide showing the predictive results. Yeah. And what that's good for is it does something called logistic regression, where it's statistically controlling for the other factors. So we know race, we know gender, we know SDS. These are all significant predictors. And what putting them in a model with the preschool promise participation, you're able to look at preschool promise in the context of if you were to sort of control for the other factors. So the control is a really important piece of this, then, in my mind, when we're looking at these, because it's more of an app, maybe a more apples to apples. Is that a way to think about it? Right, right. Like sort of all of the things being held constant that we know and that we have available, we're still seeing that difference in its ability to predict the demonstrated randomness of the contract factors. Yeah, it's two things going on. One is the control for it. The other thing is the test for statistical significance. Okay. To say, even after controlling for it, can we say that CPP is making a difference that is statistically significant to the point where we can actually say that the program is, the program and its components, which is quality preschool, is actually effective. And that's what he's talking about. Thank you. I have more of a statement than a question. I'm not questioning the data at all. The data is what it is. And from where I sit, having watched the program grow, I have definitely seen growth, especially in your tenure. So I'm just going to say that. What I get concerned about is not just about this data in terms of what I see, but it's more global than that. It's like whenever you look at data and you always see the performance areas by race, and there's always a gap. And there's always a gap. And we always, because we do this, always attribute it to lack of access or lack of resources. And so, you know, one day I hope that we can see data that tells us that something is different, because it's an equity issue, that something is different that makes the access and the economics less a factor. And I see, you know, as having sat on the board at CPS, I see that, I've seen that, I've been, I was on that board for eight years, and it's consistently, uh-oh, Monica got up on that. I'm definitely going to agree with you 100%. Okay. This is one of the most difficult issues that we deal with, because I don't care what it is, a lot of times we're going to find this difference. All the time, yeah. And it is 100% a systems issue. Yes. And however we can say that in our reports, and we've really tried to say this in our reports, and we used to didn't even, and my team will say yes on this, we used to never do race analyses. We used to only do race in the context of income analyses. And we would never have any graphs that would say black, Hispanic, or whatever. And we stopped doing that because then no one paid attention to race, and people didn't think that race mattered. And I'm torn about, you know, it's a catch-22 on this. So 
I um, appreciate the discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think because we do have race in this report and we do have income in this report and they're intricately tied together. Yes. Not only, and it's still a very simplistic analysis. We mm -hmm. could talk about, you know, justice. We could talk about mm -hmm. equity. We could talk about so many things, but you're right. It comes back to us to say, what do we do about it? Yes, right. and, and thank you because it is systemic. It's it not is. just what Absolutely. CPP does, mm -hmm. not just what mm -hmm. CPS, but it's global, you it's know. Absolutely and, and it just irritates my soul. Um, I, yeah. Okay. Great. I'm done. <laughs> I have both my hands up now. I love it when board members set me up to make it so easy for me to do my job. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that because, to your point, a couple of things. Some of the questions that you posed are um, not only research evaluation questions, but they're things that the board has to grapple with. Mm -hmm. So following this meeting, what we always do is collect all of these questions, bring it back mm -hmm. to the governance committee who sets board education topics, so you can expect mm -hmm. to hear more about those specific things. We've talked previously about ELL and our outreach to them and how that works. But to your point, Carolyn, that is what this gallery walk is about, right? Mm -hmm. It talks about the limitations of data. It talks about looking at the systemic approach to what we call universal early education, not preschool, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It is why equity is in our mission, so that we look at this from a global perspective. It is why sometimes here in Cincinnati, um, we consider poverty as a proxy for race, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're so closely intertwined in what we do. You will see in the advertisements here the new webinar that's coming from Lena that talks about how do we look at kindergarten readiness with all those socio factors and other things besides just a KRA score. That is the discussion that I hope that we have over the next year when we start to grapple with those quick questions to say how do the things that you're talking about influence our ability to drive our mission and how do we need to expand or contract our mission or be very intentional on how we deliver it to have the impact that we want to have. Um, so at, at this point, I'm going to be shifting. So I mean, it's a really important conversation, right? So, uh, and it is, Carolyn, to your point, uh, any data that we look at, right, on any indicator shows dramatic racial disparities. It's no different. I think the state is also showing that CPP is an equity strategy, right? It's, it's having the most impact yeah. Yeah. on low income uh, and black and Hispanic children. The challenge is that they're already, it, it, it's, it's a massive investment, right? Historic, and we're proud of it. But in the big picture of dramatic centuries of massive wealth and racial inequality, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket, right? So th they're already coming far behind, right? By the time they get to three, right? They're already, start, they're already coming to, the, to preschool, right? With significant disadvantages. Right, and after preschool, it continues after. So it's making a difference, and it's making, and it's making more difference for the kids who need it the most. But in the context of what we're up against, right, this massive inequality, it's positive, but insufficient to closing the gaps. Is that fair from the evaluator's standpoint? <laughs> I know you yeah. want to do that. <laughs> um, so I don't don't think I moved ahead here, but I'm on page 19 of the, the, the handout, looking at the Hispanic population particularly, do we have a breakdown of like of the 250-ish in that cohort? How many are English language learners? Because these numbers are very problematic. You know, looking at that cohort specific, individually. Yeah. Um, within that. Within the report as it is, I, I don't believe we separated by that, but we do have, um, there's a couple um, language variables available in, in sugar, um, and that's, uh, there's an there's English primary language, you know, uh, or there's uh, language spoken at home. Um, the, one of the difficulties <clears throat> with doing uh, additional analysis on, on Hispanic population is it's been very small. Then once we try and start cutting it up, 
small and then you start getting skewing, um, you actually see that when you start breaking it up in the report uh, by SES as well. See some, uh, some groups actually have massive coverage, so fewer. Um, but, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. One thing I'll say about the ELL, to your point, it's relevant to the Hispanic population, yeah. but also to the non Hispanic yeah. population. Yeah. And that's a variable that we can request from CPF and probably get some data out of sugar. And I think it's something that's, that is timely uh, because of the growing immigrant population. And it's something that we should definitely explore in the future. I would also um, be cautious on how it is self-reported mm -hmm. and identified because our source of information that's in sugar that we collect is through our application process and uploaded, which is sometimes not as uniform as when they get to the CPS side of how they define that um, in terms of not only family education, right, but how people consider that and also some inherent biases that people have of identifying that way um, before they choose to do so. Yeah. And I don't want to take any more time. I will just mention that we, we, we did this analysis quite a few years ago, and what we learned is those numbers, regardless, um, of Hispanic or non-Hispanic, the data, the KRA data was very, um, they were very delayed at the, at the kindergarten level, but there was um, some impressive catch up by third grade. And I think, you know, looking at it in terms of the, in, in the context of preschool, which we didn't do, would be very interesting. So one other thing I would like to just put out going forward when we talk about with the other Ohio preschool initiatives and the other six on what factors they think make the most difference. One is always attendance. Um, I also see here that you've delved down and done mobility. I would be interested to know if from your perspective there are any other things that may pop up that you may see as variables or factors that may influence that. We're all in agreement about attendance. Other people don't have the same mobility challenges in other communities that we have. Um, but if there's a third or something else or another factor, we would like to prospectively look at that going forward. Um, so just to keep that in mind as we start to build our scope of work and our next, what we're going to capture for our, our next evaluation for year eight. Yes. Well, um, I'm going to move on to the patient access section. This is, this is a much shorter section, but um, I'll be covering enrollment. Um, uh, for preschoolers receiving tuition assistance and also for the CPD's uh, community provider network. Uh, before we take a look at this year's enrollment, I just want to put in perspective the uh, incomes of the family CPD is serving. So the slide is showing how uh, average cost of attending high quality preschool will be out of reach for many families. Uh, for example, single parents uh, with uh, one child living in poverty level would spend nearly half of their income on preschool if they earned uh, $19,723 a year or $765 of the $1,643 that they earn per month. So that would be an $878 for housing, food, transportation, and all other things. And um, families spend even more on child care with more, ch uh, with more children and especially those infants whose cost of This first slide here is a, a, provides a look at how enrollment has changed over the years for tuition-assisted preschoolers at community-based providers. And as of 23-24, we are at a total enrollment of 1,087 preschoolers. This has been increased to set over 17% since 2022-23. Uh, uh, we now see that uh, enrollment has not only recovered from the setbacks from the pandemic, but are, um, also has reached the highest enrollment numbers to date. In addition to enrollment, um, attain attendance rates have also increased to their highest rates to date, and chronic absenteeism is at its lowest to date. Uh, since last year, uh, average annual attendance rates increased by 1.2 percentage points to a rate of 88.4 percent, and likewise, chronic absenteeism decreased by 3.8 percentage points. Uh, down to a rate of 44.3 percent. 
these are the two scores uh, being served in uh, that Mr. John Plaza on the map of Cincinnati, color coded uh, by SES Quartals, for some added context. Uh, so this cohort is made up of uh, 492 three year old and 595 four year old preschoolers. The tan neighborhoods represent what we call quality uh, gap neighborhoods. And these are just areas high in socioeconomic risk factors and low in the supply of high quality preschool seats. You can see that uh, large concentrations of students occupying um, those areas of the city. And furthermore, you see that the majority of points are red and yellow, and that's indicating uh, that they are SES 1 and 2. Okay. <laughs> the next one, the next slide is more important. Hopefully that works. Yes, okay. <laughs> All you needed to know here um, was this was year one. <laughs> and there were 66 in total for uh, TAA, QA, QI uh, providers. And here we are at Pier 7. And this is showing uh, that uh, in, uh, we're at now a total of 221 combined uh, TAA and QI providers, which is an increase of 155 preschool providers and uh, providers since year one. Uh, additionally, we see that 147 of the year seven uh, providers were three, uh, three to five star TA providers. And uh, since last year, the total number of TA providers increased by 10 providers. And since year one, uh, have increased by 107. And CDP also assessed QI providers from the movement from quality to high quality preschool. Uh, so 20 QI providers converted to TA uh, in year seven, making a seven year total of 122 conversions since the inception. This is the summary of the number of quality and high quality seats in the entire uh, CPP community based network as of year seven. Uh, you see that uh, the total seat capacity for community based providers is estimated at 4,181. And overall, the seat capacity uh, for TA providers increased by 246 seats since last year. And also, for the first time, uh, additional data were acquired by. by uh, um, from for sleep with children containing a uh, higher department of job and family service estimates for preschool enrollment um, or field seats in this case. Um, and these data indicate that 2,313 preschoolers were enrolled in CPP uh, community based providers. And these uh, estimates originate from the JFS uh, inspection reports and are in, in, um, and have been a pretty valuable our evaluation um, and we hope to continue obtaining these data in the coming years so we get a sort of trend in enrollment relative to seat capacity. Um, finally, this map is, is showing all uh, high quality um, or three to five star providers in the footprint. This map includes uh, CPP TA preschools within the community based network. Uh, those are in blue. Uh, CPS preschools in red, and um, other high quality preschools uh, that are unaffiliated um, in green. So this shows us how CPP's work for other network has resulted in a greater share of all high quality providers within the CPS uh, district footprint. And the total number of high quality providers at the time of this analysis was 225, which is an increase of 24 since last year. CPP, TA, community-based, um, and CPS preschools together make up 88.6% of high-quality providers in Cincinnati. And that leaves just 23 unaffiliated high-quality providers marked over three points on the map. So uh, at this time, I'd like to pause to give you an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, any more questions? We have 20 minutes left and we're going to fit it in. The last part of the presentation today 
I'm going to focus on the insights from teachers and providers. Um, they shared their preschool experiences with us through our evaluation survey, as well as the advisory panel. So we intentionally engage the teachers and providers and stakeholders who are directly involved with CPD because their input is really critical to informing and understanding all of this data that we're looking at. Um, they also provide us with meaningful information about what's working well and what is needed to advance quality preschools here in Cincinnati. Um, their feedback also helps us envision, like I mentioned, all of this data and all of these graphs that we just looked at and like what this really looks like on the ground in real life. So I'll be highlighting what we heard from the 92 preschool providers who completed the survey. And these providers represent 44.4% of the programs in the CPP community provider network. Um, first, their insights about the impact of CPP tuition assistance. So for the past five years, We've asked teachers and providers about the impact of tuition assistance, and their responses have been very consistent. They feel that CPP tuition assistance allows children with the greatest needs to enroll in high-quality preschools. It reduces financial stress for parents and providers and helps parents maintain employment, as well as the funding translates into support for quality improvements classroom materials, and other resources that benefit all children in their programs, not just those that are receiving tuition assistance. And this quote from one of the providers, um, I think really just highlights the benefits of tuition assistance with them saying that CPPTA has positively impacted my program, children, and families in so many ways. CPP has helped me to pay my teachers more competitive wage, purchase educational equipment, and have a music program that teaches through music and movement. They have helped the families with family engagement activities. I don't know if I could stay open without the support of CPP. We also asked them about their enrollment and capacity. So this slide captures what's helping preschools with enrollment and what challenges that they're facing. Uh, survey providers said that they face several challenges in serving the number of children that they are licensed to enroll including staffing, space, financial, transportation, and parent involvement. And these aren't just challenges that are facing the CPP provider network. It's not a local challenge. This is, these are challenges that are impacting early childhood education throughout the country. Um, but what's great is that the providers really express how instrumental the CPP has been in supporting them with these challenges and improving their teacher retention their program quality, and helping them be sustainable. Um, these providers said that they employ 644 teachers and staff in their preschools. What makes this important to point out is that this number represents half of the preschools in the network, and there are many more teachers and staff who are employed by programs in the CPP community provider network. So when we're thinking about the value of CPP funding and the work that we're doing towards solutions that are driving equitable preschools, this gives us perspective about how essential CPP is for ensuring that we have quality teachers and that children have access to quality preschool now and in the future. Um, we continue to learn about special needs um, this year. In the survey and also with our advisory panel, we asked parents, teachers, and providers to share their experiences with special needs. We learned that more than 71% of responding providers serve children with special needs, and many of them have children who are showing signs of disability or delay, but they need to be formally evaluated. We also heard from the parents of children with special needs who said that they would like more support in and out of school particularly around navigating the IEP process and documenting their child's strengths and challenges to inform new teachers um, about their child. Parents expressed the importance of rapport and strong communication with their child's teacher for building trust and then caring for their child and working together so that they can best support their child's learning and development. Um, we do know that support exists for um, special needs children and the, the supports that parents are talking about. 
through CPP, through the um, Cincinnati Public Schools and other school districts, through the Ohio Department of Education and other local partners. But what we're hearing um, from these um, providers and parents suggests that maybe some of them need help connecting to these resources or what's available isn't meeting the demand. Um, we mentioned a few times today the many benefits of partnering with CPP, so I just want to spend the time on this slide to read the quote from our CPP providers, with one saying, our program has benefited from participating in CPP by supporting the center with quality improvement, staffing wages, and student academic success. CPP has helped this program grow in family involvement and family events for kindergarten readiness with speakers to talk to parents about how they can help their children ready for a successful kindergarten transition. And another provider said, the collective benefits from participating in the CPP provider network and receiving CPP support have created a positive, nurturing, and enriching environment for everyone involved. Our program has seen significant improvements in quality and service delivery. Our teachers and staff are more skilled and motivated and our families have greater access to high quality early education and support services. This program has been nothing but awesome. Um, next we have our preschooler survey. So for the third year, um, we've asked teachers to survey their preschoolers about their school experience. Um, preschoolers said that their overall sense of school was very positive, um, with more than 90% saying that school teaches them to take turns and they like to play outside at school. Um, teachers also asked the preschoolers to share their favorite thing about coming to school. And they, of course, said they like to go outside, they like lunch, they like um, playing dramatic play, singing songs. Others said they um, like music and playing in the kitchen, playing with Legos, going outside and painting. Others liked that they learned about butterflies, numbers, and fruits and vegetables or going to kindergarten and meeting new teachers and friends. So lots of um, positive connections and positive feedback that we're hearing from our littlest learners about their preschool experience. Um, and here are just some more really inspiring quotes um, that further support what we've heard about parents, teachers, and provider satisfaction with CPP and how much CPP is benefiting them. I'll read some of these quotes for us. Um, we are so grateful to be partners with CPP. Preschool can sometimes be overlooked and it's so nice as a director to have so many resources and knowledgeable partners, said one provider. Uh, CPP has helped me with coaching and buying supplies for my program. CPP helped my program go from unrated program to a five-star rated program. That was another provider. Um, a parent said that the CPP is amazing. Their son improved 50%, which is worse so far. And then finally, a teacher said that CPP has provided the necessary funds to assist with learning materials as well as other devices that has assisted a child's developmental needs that I otherwise would not have been able to purchase. So as we start to wrap up, we just wanted to celebrate CPP's impact over the last seven years as well. We've mentioned a lot of these throughout um, our presentation today, but these results just show how CPP is achieving its mission and vision by expanding access to affordable quality preschool for three and four year olds in Cincinnati. We had more than 11,500 preschoolers enroll in CPP and more than 100 quality High quality providers added to the network since its inception. CPP has built partnerships with providers to increase high quality programs, supporting 122 providers with achieving a high quality rating. And CPP is contributing to an equitable early childhood community and the sustainability of high quality programs with our results showing that CPP is preparing preschoolers for kindergarten and beyond as we heard earlier from Peter. So in closing and looking forward, we've seen how our collective efforts of CPP, our partners and supporters 
have had a significant impact on early childhood education and preschool in our community. By continuing to support our preschool teachers and providers, streamlining information sharing, and focusing on systems level factors, we can ensure that our momentum in preparing children for our school continues and that everyone, every child has the opportunity to succeed. So thank you for your dedication and commitment to this important work. We hope that we will continue to collaborate and innovate together to make a lasting difference. So thank you. for her partnership and leadership of this initiative, for sure. Thank you. And, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to also thank my team as well. So thank you. I have one quick comment, and it is one thank you so much for this information. I thought it was very thorough, and I always say, I'm not a person that does well with numbers and data, but this was very clear. And as somebody who was involved from the beginning, I have just seen it develop so much more and it's much more robust, it's much more helpful. And I'm really, this excites me about the, and gives direction to where I think the program will go. And so thank you so much. It was, it was very good, thanks. Thank you, yes. thank you very much. And I just make a broader comment. I think this was a phenomenal job. I think one thing for us to consider, Shara, is, and this may already be in place, is how do we think about our child care providers in terms of establishing them in certain tiers that we now can look through through data? The reason why I say that, that there are always going to be consistent broad challenges as it relates to child care, but I do wonder would some of the responses of data look differently if we had strategic tiers for our child care providers? Um, the reason why I say that is because one of the things that you just kind of highlighted was, I want to see for, for some of the less obvious things to focus on, what are maybe some nuanced opportunities for us to see for, for us to target to continue to improve. And then I think the last comment I'll make very broadly is, is I'm looking forward to our budget um, and seeing where we have our innovation line because I would want to learn more about how we're going to test and learn some of these things. We are data informed not necessarily data driven. So as it relates to any new things we want to try, any things we want to do, what then is our strategy and plan around implementing something fast and learning? So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you as always to the innovation team. And this is not a one and done. As, as you all know, as I mentioned, we have a series of board education opportunities to talk about that, and I am so dying to see the answers to all of your questions. So I'm so glad. I look forward to it because we have a, whole, a lot of other agenda items um, to get to, but we always appreciate feedback um, from our board, recommendations, and suggestions. We take that back to the innovation team, and I just would like to take a moment to give another round of applause to this whole team. We take calls from us 24 7 who works with us when we change the scope of work, who says we're going to come through with that, and also not to fail to recognize the heavy lift that Fourth Street for Children did for us, which is CCRNR, um, to provide us with data information that otherwise we would not have access to, as well as the willingness and the data sharing with Cincinnati Public Schools to make sure that we can present our mission presentation to you. So it is a people promise show, but it is a collective effort. So we appreciate that from everybody. And if I may, I'd like to introduce our next presenter. Um, part of what we have done to do it on our evaluations is to have a quantitative piece and a qualitative piece. So to some of the things that you mentioned, what we realized is we needed a broader perspective. We also needed to rely on our partners in the community, regionally, statewide, and nationally, and to build off of that data that they collect. So we were very fortunate to be partners with Roswell, Ohio, which is a statewide agency, and I'm pleased to welcome Troy Hunter, who is the Senior Policy Director for Rockwood, Ohio, to tell us a little bit about the new initiative that's happened in Ohio with the Rapid Survey and what we focus on here in the district. So, Troy, please Hello. Um, as Shari 
I said I am the senior policy um, director at Groundwork Ohio. I used to be the director of research evaluation and performance, which is where my heart really lies is in that data and research. We had to change my name because I uh, people just thought I was way nerdier than I was or that I was smarter than I was. Um, I, so I, I kid, I love research, I love data, and I love to be here to talk about some of the work that we're doing here at Groundwork Ohio. And do I have control over these slides? Yeah. No. So if I just push this, I can change it. Like I said before, people thought I was a lot smarter than I actually was, which is why we had to change my title. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about an initiative that we have done called the Family Voices Project. But first, if you're not familiar with Groundwork Ohio, we are a um, nonpartisan public policy research and advocacy nonprofit that really focuses on championing healthy development and early learning strategies to support children and families here in Ohio from the prenatal to age five period. Our work is centered around our policy framework. And you see kind of illustrated up here, our approach is that investing in children early is the best way to advance positive outcomes for children and families across the state. We have four different policy pillars or factors that we utilize in our framework that we believe influence um, outcomes for children and families. Early learning and child care, health care access and quality, early childhood trauma prevention, and economic stability. And we believe by focusing in those four areas that we are able to influence outcomes through a policy perspective and advocacy perspective here in the state of Ohio. So everything we do is through this framework. Um, we implement it heavily in our uh, state policy agenda process. Um, we are about to head into um, in a, a budget advocacy season where right now the governor is deciding um, and making his, his decisions on what he is going to introduce in February, um, kind of as that first um, version of the state budget for the next two years. And then from February to July, it'll go back and forth between Senate and House um, to hopefully have as much in it to uh, invest in children and families as possible. And part of our process to getting to that policy agenda, which we're gonna release publicly in November uh, as an organization, is uh, th this, this input process. So we seek input, we survey our full network, we evaluate policy opportunities, we develop and amplify a comprehensive policy agenda and work to implement that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about our seeking input process and why we've invested in um, some of the projects that we have done. We also really value and center family voice and the work that we do. Um, so as Sharon was talking about this, you know, using quantitative and qualitative data, um, that, that is important, but also just making sure that whatever data we're using is centering the experiences of real life people across the state of Ohio. Um, we do kind of two big research projects that we're working on right now, one of them being our early childhood dashboard. We publish this every two years. Um, what this is is a snapshot at state and populist, state department and populist data on what do the numbers tell us about children and families here in the state of Ohio. Uh, we look over those four policy pillars that we talked about earlier, early childhood, um, early learning and childcare access, healthcare access and quality, trauma prevention, economic security, and we look to see what do things currently look like for children and families in those areas, and are children healthy and ready to learn in Ohio? Um, we're about to publish, and I say about, it's been a few months, but it feels like about, because I've been digging through Excel sheets and data numbers and percent, percentages. Um, we're about to publish our 2025 Early Childhood Dashboard in January, around January of 2025, and that's gonna be looking at all of the data. And the reason I bring that up is because um, as we talk about our partnership with the Rapid Survey Project and our Family Voices Project, um, there is a lot of considerations when we think about state and populist data. It is a snapshot in time, and we only have um, data available at certain points in time. So right now, some of the most recent data from um, our, our partners at the state or that we're able to get may be from 2022, 2023. Um, that is, it's a data at this point um, that, that might not reflect what's actually happening right now, but it's what we have and it's what we have to look at until the next round of data is available publicly um, whenever different departments release it. 
I say that to say there's this huge thing that you might have heard of or might not have heard of called the pandemic that really influenced how we understand and look at state data or, or just any populace or data statistics because what things looked like in 2019, which at the time that uh, the pandemic hit might have been some of the most recent newest data we had, it wasn't reflective of what was happening in that moment for childcare programs, for families, for children, because in 2019 looked very, very different than March um, of 2020, uh, July of 2020. The data wasn't reflective of what was happening in that moment. So is the rapid survey project kind of came out of that need in the pandemic. It, they, they came out of a need of, oh wow, our data is not reflective of what is actually happening in this moment. How do we understand and how do we get to a better perspective of what's actually happening? So the rapid survey project developed in April of 2020 and um, they kind of just soared, and we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth to these slides, I probably didn't uh, organize them in the right way. Um, but, and they really soared because they were able to, what they figured out is if we can get that information in and out as fast as possible, we're gonna have a better understanding of what's happening. So they surveyed over 20,000 parents and 7,000 providers across all 50 states. Um, they, have, they got picked up by the Stanford University um, so they are now housed in Stanford, and they're just now starting to expand and look at how can we um, use this system, which is get surveys out quickly, get data back quickly, analyze that data quickly, report it out quickly. How can we use that model to, um, to support children and families in all different areas? So we partnered with the Rapid Survey Project at Groundwork Ohio because we really um, valued and appreciated their approach. We, uh, I'm gonna talk about a series of surveys that we've done and, and a little bit more about the project, but we did the data I'm about to talk about today, the survey went out in April of 2024, and we got, uh, it ended in May of uh, 2024, and we had a published report with all of our data analytics and key findings by end of June of 2024, which is completely unheard of. I came from Ohio State University prior to being in Groundwork, and I couldn't even get a request to buy a chair in that amount of time when I worked at Ohio State University. I couldn't even get a, uh, an approved email to send out to a group of people by our government affairs people in that amount of time. But to have a statewide survey out, take that data in, process it, analyze it, find the key findings, and be able to talk about that in that short period of time is instrumental in our ability to really impact and influence uh, policy at this time. And when I was talking about our dashboard, so the 2023 dashboard, which didn't maybe reflect all of the things that were happening in COVID because the data was before COVID happened, now we're starting to see some trends, and I don't wanna ruin the surprise for anybody when it gets published, and thinking about how do we think about some of this data, because now some of the, the data is influenced by investments, by programs, by things that were happening during the pandemic. So as we think about early childhood programs and early childhood investments, um, ARPA dollars, have, we have seen a historic investment from the federal government in the, in the form of federal relief dollars. And we've seen a lot of positive in, impact by federal relief dollars being flooded into, into the state of Ohio through our early childhood systems. So the data that we have right now from 2022, 2023, and some of 2024 is reflective of investment from federal dollars. But we know as of yesterday, all of that money had to be spent and it no longer is, exists within, in terms of a continuous funding stream. So our, our, our data sources from our dashboard, which are important and, and they're what we have, so what we have to use, aren't reflective of some of the challenges that we are going to see over the next year or, or couple years and how, and how families and children and educators and programs are impacted. So to be able to, to survey families and rapid dose uh, provider surveys as well and say what's actually happening right now because our data doesn't tell us the whole story. What's actually happening and how are you impacted? So I'm gonna skip through some of these because I think I only have 20 minutes and I tend to talk a lot. Um, so I, I will go as fast as I can. <laughs> Um, so as I talked about earlier, um, we have this nice report that I have copies if anybody wants one, it's available digitally. These aren't fancy printed copies, these are like right off our printer because I didn't have any available um, for today. But this is a part of a series of surveys that we are doing in the state of Ohio. We partnered with Rapid um, to do a series of surveys. We did survey one in April um, and closed in May of 2024. We just closed 
was surveyed too last week. Um, so I, I'm excited to start diving into that data in the coming weeks, and we're going to publish that with our dashboard in January, around, around, I'm not supposed to say that, but in case something learned, so I'll put my gun. So around January, <laughs> when we publish that, we're going to publish that data with it. And um, we have a plan to do a couple more surveys post that to be able to ask different things and respond to different things that are happening. So in, in our survey one, which is the data I'm going to talk about today, um, we have classified and categorized our data into these four key areas. Early learning and child care, health care access and quality, early childhood trauma prevention, and economic stability. And this is a theme you're going to see consistent throughout all of the products and data that we put out because it's our framework of how we look at um, the challenges and, and the problems that are happening right now in our systems. So here is an overview of the demographics of survey respondents. We had 755 parents and caregivers respond to uh, the survey when it was open for three weeks. Um, we we partnered with our stakeholders and local partners across the state to get that out to families. And 755 parents and caregivers responded to that, covering 932 children. So the survey is reflective of data for 932 children. Um, I, I don't know the exact numbers because there's this data cleaning process. It's really boring that I'm not gonna go for you guys with, but we don't know the exact number of respondents until we clean up the data to see which, which ones are right or wrong. I do know that the total number of surveys um, is about 50% more than the ones we had in survey one. So we were expecting to see a much higher turnout, which is great, um, because I think it's so fast we're able to say, we did the survey, here's the results within a few, you know, a month. Um, it, I think it encouraged people to participate more in um, and to share it out. So in, in survey one, 75% um, of respondents were women, 25% were men. Um, I want to pause on that for just a second because I think this speaks to a systemic issue of, of women carrying the burden of caregivers. So when we talk about the challenges and the, um, and the discrepancies and disparities that we see reflected um, in some of the data points we're going to talk about, it's also representing a majority of women respondents and women caregivers that are disproportionately responsible for caregiving um, Family structure, 75% of families were in two-parent house, two households, 25% were in single-parent households, 66% um, of resp uh, respondents identified as white, 22% as black, 7% Hispanic, and 5% others. The survey was offered in Spanish and in English. Um, and then you see social economic stats represented here as well, um, about, we had a variety of different, in different brackets. And, and I'll kind of point out a couple different things as we go. Um, out of our respondents, 248 had one child, 302 had two children, and 185 had three or more children. And then you can see some statistics of what their uh, education level of the respondent was. Demographics of survey respondents. Um, so this might look a little funky to some people. We, we took a long time to get to this point of why we regionalized um, in this way. Um, we wanted to cover Appalachia, Ohio, North, um, East, Northwest, West Central and Southwest, you'll see Southwest covers the least amount of active physical counties. Um, so in some ways, we may consider looking at West Central and Southwest together, um, but there's kind of reasons we went into that. That being said, uh, when we're done with all of our surveys, we're going to do some regional and county-based reports, um, but we just don't have the bandwidth to do it for every single survey report. Um, so we, we will be doing some regional, we're gonna uh, looking at doing one, I'm not supposed to promise many of us <laughs> actually done, but in Cincinnati and Hamilton County. So we spent a lot of time today talking about the impact and the importance of quality early childhood experiences and programs like Cincinnati Preschool Promise. We know, and we can see by the data that you guys presented, that investing in early and high quality early learning experiences results better results for kids. We know that. You guys through a bunch of, of data up on the screen today that's, that proved that very fact. When we implement programs like TPP and we invest in high quality early learning for children, it begats strong results. What this survey is gonna look at is, okay, we already know that, but what is the access to these programs like CPP and, and high quality early child education? And the story that we're gonna see throughout this data is that parenting in general is hard. Before anything else um, shows up, when, when parents wake up in the morning, it's a 
heartbreaking part. It's a, it's a hard experience to, to care for children. That being said, Ohio's families are experiencing stress as they navigate barriers within the system that serve them, them and their children. Um, some situational, some, um, some long-term, some deeply systemic barriers that impact their ability to meet the needs of their children. We also see that these barriers limit access to quality health and early learning experiences for their children who have shown to have increasing unmet behavioral and developmental needs. We also see financial hardship creates additional challenges for parents as they navigate services for their children to be able to thrive. So in our survey, we found that almost 60% of respondents felt that their current child care was not affordable. More than one in three respondents reported difficulty in finding care. So there's probably, we'll say there's 18 people in here because that's divisible by three in my head. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, six people in six people in here would would say, based on this number, that their current child care was unaffordable. Or, excuse me, six people in here would say that they they found difficulty finding care. Over half of the people in here would say that. Almost 60% of respondents, respondents felt their current child care was unaffordable, and 60% of respondents reported on relying on publicly funded child care. So um, in, that's covering all of our, all 755 of our respondents. Over half, 60%, two thirds, were, almost two thirds were saying, were saying that they were utilizing publicly funded child care subsidies. And more than 40% reported difficulty in finding a provider who would take their publicly funded child care subsidy. That number um, increases by 20% Healthcare access and quality, nearly one in five parents reported missing a well child checkup within the last year. The most common reasons parents were unable to get their children to well child checkups um, were the inability to get time off work, almost half of them reporting that, and the cost of care, 41%. Almost one in uh, five percent of parents reported that their child was not able to access timely care when they were sick, and over one in five uh, reported that they were not able to have timely access to a specialist. So one out of every five families said they weren't able to get timely care when their child was sick, and more than that, could not find a specialist in a timely manner when they needed it. So we think about early childhood trauma prevention, nearly three in four respondents expressed concerns of internal or external signs of emotional distress. Internal signs um, spoke to things like anxiety or fear, external signs of stress spoke to um, tantrums, behavioral challenges, external distress. So more than 70% of respondents reported concerns that their child was showing signs of emotional distress. And over 40% of respondents reported that they had concerns about their child's development and more than half expressed concerns with their child's behavior. Also just want to note here, this was across um, income brackets. So this wasn't just true for families who were, were considered low income. Our, you know, almost 70% of our families above 400% FPL were expressing concerns about their children's behavior or emotional distress. More than one in three respondents reported that they were currently receiving help from a mental health professional. This um, goes up to over 50% for parents with children with disabilities. So as we think about our caregivers, um, more than one in three percent, one in, more than one in three of respondents reported high levels of stress, and 65% reported that they could benefit from additional supports for parenting. Um, more than 90, I do want to point out this like little sliver of positivity. More than 95% of parents reported having a social support system. I found this really strong and important because our parents, even with even with the majority of our parents reporting that they do have a social support system, they're still experiencing challenges in finding and navigating care, getting their children to, uh, to well child checkup visits, getting timely access to health care for their children, despite having strong social support systems in their life. Another thing here, more, most parents, not some parents, not a lot of parents, most parents were working. 95% reported they were working, and 20% reported they were working at more than one job. This goes up to 27% of single income households. In 
enrollment in Medicaid and SNAP and WIC, we're at 27%, 60%, and 13%. Um, I do want to pull out this quote, um, and, and we had we had lots of ex open extended responses um, in this project as well that we're going to think about how to analyze these in different ways. But from a parent in Central Ohio, currently one of the biggest challenges is managing the rising cost of living due to inflation. It can be tough to balance our budget and ensure we have enough for essentials like food, housing, utilities, and prices as they continue to rise. As prices continue to rise, I was just sitting in a listening session last night um, for uh, parents in Montgomery County and listening to some of the stories of the choices that they have to make in terms of if you don't have a car, then you to, to get to an appointment to get services for your child, you have to consider getting your um, getting your child on the bus on a bus line getting them in their stroller onto the bus and then finding a provider that's off of a bus line to be able to make it to um, make it to these appointments. So the financial reality for these families is really real. And these problems exist before any financial hardship, right? There's an access issue before financial hardship comes into play. So you think about that just exasperates the challenges for families, specifically uh, marginalized and historically oppressed populations such as families living in low-income, black and brown children, So I just zoomed through that probably quicker than I would have normally. Um, so I'm gonna pause. That is not all the data that's in our report. That's just some key highlights um, throughout. I do have copies of our report with us. Do we have any questions about the overall process, any of the data that I talked about today? A lot less than Chris Kim than CPTC. I have a question. <laughs> um, this is pretty general, I guess. Um, as I was looking at the report before I came, So um, how do you, at, at some point, all this is going to translate to, I guess the end game is, how do you influence our, our government, our legislators to create policy that's going to eradicate all this bad stuff that's happening? So um, in terms of things like access to health care and, and the challenges with working and, and those kind of things, is there a strategy there to bring on board people to address those specific pillars that you have. Like for example, people um, not having access to child care because of their work schedules or something. Is there a discussion around uh, employers and the role they can play in all of that? And this is an age old problem because you know I was that that parent that had three kids and had to work, you know, six or seven hours a week and trying to find a place for and really any resources that we make, what's the purpose of them and how do we use them and, and why go through all this trouble to, to dig in and find these numbers and, and how are we going to use those. Groundwork Ohio, as a, as a statewide organization, we are going to publish a policy agenda that is influenced heavily from the, from the data from this project, from other data projects that we've done. Um, we did 14 um, listening sessions across the state to get into communities to hear what was the unique challenges happening um, in their community, and their county, um, taking that into consideration. We worked with um, our close, closest stakeholder groups to talk about what are the challenges that, you, that you're seeing um, in, in your field. We have three advisory councils at Groundwork Ohio. Um, we have a early learning advisory council that's made up of leaders um, in early learning space across the state, including a lot of our CCRNRs like Vanessa back there and, and Shara um, here at preschool. Um, Promise in Cincinnati, uh, we have a maternal and young child health advisory council that's made up of leaders, similar leaders in different spaces, and we have a family um, voice advisory council that's made up of family serving organizations and family members to give feedback all into this process. And when we publish that in um, November, that is going to consist of a, a very long list of lots of things we think could help in these different areas and reasons why they would help, but also it's going to pull out key priorities that we, uh, as, a, as, as an organization, came to uplift as some of the biggest things we need to start with to, to serve children and families here in Ohio. And using our resources like our data and our educational materials to talk with policymakers on why this specific policy, why this policy solution um, is necessary at this point in time, and who is this going to impact, and what does the data tell us about how people are being impacted by how things Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it, it 
kind of moved the needle closer. So I guess, like I said, for, so for me, after all that's done, uh, and you present a policy agenda, there's still going to have to be collaboration with the people, not just the people who are going to change policy, but I, I always look past policy and how is it going to be implemented, and who all needs to buy into it even before you take the time to do the policy, because if they're not going to buy into it, then what was all this for? So it, somewhere, hopefully, that's being queued up by somebody. <laughs> yeah, and we have multiple approaches to this work um, in terms of multiple different entryways from uh, from budget advocacy, which is looking for investment into specific policies and programs, putting money behind policies that can act. You know, we could we can make a policy today. Um, make sure I can say this. We could, yeah, I can. We can make a policy today that said childcare is free for everybody. Yeah. Like that that law could be passed today, mm -hmm. but without money invested in that, where are they going to go? Because we have child care all across Cincinnati and Hamilton County and, and across the state of Ohio that have no teachers. That even if child care was free for everybody, when child care workers make on average under $15 an hour in Ohio, who's going to serve those kids? So it's, you know, this, this is one of many strategies that we implement as a statewide organization, but the policy has to come with an investment in our budget advocacy process and our state budget advocacy policy agenda. They're probably in each thing that we are going to include in there is probably a billion dollars. Like it, it's expensive to serve kids. We know we're, you know, we're going to get as we're going to fight to get as much of that as possible. Um, but in the, there's different entryways into that because then you have you know buy-in and implementation and at the local level, um, all very different strategies, all very different entry points. But as we think about right now, what is what are we looking at? It's that upcoming budget that's going to lay out what investments are we putting into programs specifically in children and families here in the state of Ohio for the next two years. presenters today, it's not, as I said, the only opportunity that we'll have to engage with them, to have conversations with people who feed into the data, and some of them will be hanging around for the rest of this afternoon, and we will look with the governance committee for board education topics when we can further explore. For those of you who are with us here for the annual meeting, um, we're going to do something similar that we're going to do throughout the year, which is called our gallery walk. 
And it is our effort to answer the question of how should investments in early childhood education be prioritized to have the greatest impact? In other ways, how does CPE continue to drive, expand, and deliver on our mission? You will see throughout our gallery walk of the posters of partners and resources. Um, we will be expanding and adding that as well. We know we have one coming from Four Seats for Children, so thank you for that. And um, we're launching that with our board, of course, at our annual meeting in here, but we're about to go on the road, okay? So when we send out our annual report and our year seven evaluation, we will be inviting all of our stakeholders, like some that you saw in the room, like AJ from Santa Maria, like Carolyn from CoStars and Best Point, to say, how can we come to your space as we continue this dialogue to get input from you, to learn what you think is important as we start to look at the next iteration of the Peaceful Commons? Because we all know 2025 is a hot decision point for us when we will be on the ballot again. Um, so we invite you as you engage with one another, as you visit our team's fabulous signature candy bar to get a sweet treat for the afternoon, that you take some time to look at these posters and the crucial question that we have about the investment that should be made to drive impact. Take a post-it in that corner, write your suggestions, your idea, your question. It can be anonymous or it can be with your name. Feel free to put on that flip chart back there, directly on any of the posters, because we really want to hear from you um, how we should answer that question. And just as a reminder, investments are not only money, which is always most important in any kind of society, it's good. But our investments are also our time, our capacity, our influence, all of those things to consider as we move forward. So I invite you to do that as we make the mingle. And, and it's to close this out, just to say a thank you again to our Peaceful Commons staff, those of us that are here today, Mark Warren Crump, who is our Director of Community Engagement, Laura Carr, who is our Communications Specialist, Hector Balanco, who is our Finance Director, and Kenny Delgali, who is our Senior Administrative Director, and of course, from that team, the Mathis, who is our Deputy Director. They are truly the power behind the promise that makes all of this work possible. So with that, I will say thank you all for joining us. Please share with us your insight, and we will see you hopefully for our October board meeting. Thank you. Did we have any uh, observers here? Yes, observers. Did we have any observers? I forgot. This is the end of my part. I'll turn it back over to Steve Marcia as the board chair. <laughs> any uh, comments from our? No, no observers here. All right, so um, since this is a little bit informal, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn from the board members that are still here. <laughs> so moved. All right. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We you. are adjourned. Please follow uh, Sharon's instruction about the uh, gallery walk and join the door. Oh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs>